example quickly. Go to 2 Chronicles 13. In 2 Chronicles 13, you have a king of Judah who relied upon the Lord, and because he relied upon the Lord, God, God favored him. Did you know God likes that when you rely upon him? He likes that. You know, the Bible says that he has no pleasure in, in the, you know, the strength of a man or the legs of a man, meaning how strong or powerful he is. He takes pleasure in those that fear him and those that hope in his mercy. He likes it when people depend on him. Look at 2 Chronicles 13, verse number 18. The story here, we're not going to read the whole story, but it's Abiah, the king of Judah, against Jeroboam, the king of Israel. And because Abiah relied upon the Lord, the king of Judah, notice what verse 18 says. It says, Thus the children of Israel were brought under at that time, and the children of Judah prevailed. Why? Because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. Now contrast that with, go, go to 2 Chronicles 16 now. You have here a king who's a good king most of his life. Most of his life he's a good king. His name's Asa. How many of you know King Asa from Judah? He's here in 2 Chronicles 16. But towards the end of his life, hey, Christian, don't miss this. Towards the end of his life, he stops relying on the Lord. Towards the end of his life, he stops trusting the Lord. He starts trusting himself. He starts trusting the physicians. He starts trusting foreign kings to try to deliver him. Instead of looking to an omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God, he starts looking to others and he starts looking to himself. That's a mistake. Notice 2 Chronicles. and th th He was a good king most of his life. 2 Chronicles 16, look at verse 7. The Bible says at that time, Hanani the seer, a prophet, came to Asa king of Judah. And said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria. If you read before this, Israel had come against Judah again. And the king of Judah, instead of relying on the Lord, he reaches out to Syria. He sends them all kinds of money and says, Hey, come on, help me fight against the king of Israel. Well, the prophet comes to him, verse 7 says, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria and not relied on the Lord thy God. Therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host? That was about a million-man army that he defeated previously because he relied on the Lord. With very many chariots and horsemen, yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly. Therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars." Then Asa was wroth with the seer and put him in a prison house, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. And behold, the acts of Asa, first and last, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel, verse 12. And Asa, in the thirty and ninth year of his reign, was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians." Asa, something changed. For much of his life, he had relied on the Lord. He trusted the Lord, depended on the Lord. Then at the end of life, he's now looking to himself and the physicians and foreign kings. Listen, folks, God loves it when we rely upon him. He loves it when we trust him. He loves it when we lay aside our own understanding and our own thoughts and we rely upon his word for our decisions. He loves that. He honors that. Uh, go back to Ezra, if you would. Ezra chapter 8. Notice Ezra chapter 8, verse 21 says, that He proclaimed a fast that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of Him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed, verse 22, to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek Him, but His power and His wrath is against all them that forsake Him. Verse 23, so we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. What does that mean? He answered their prayer. Hebrews 4.16 says, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When you have a need, who's the first one you go to? Where do you go first? It needs to be to the Lord. Verse 24 through 30, they took the silver and the gold that they were bringing, and they weighed it and they entrusted it to certain men 
who were faithful men. Verse 24, Then I separated twelve of the chief of the priests, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and ten of their brethren with them, and weighed unto them the silver and the gold and the vessels, even the offering of the house of our God. They're weighing it before they leave because they are going to weigh it again when they arrive. They want to make sure nothing is missing. Notice, uh, of the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his lords and all Israel there present had offered, I even weighed unto their hands 650 talents of silver and silver vessels and 100 talents and of gold and 100 talents, also 20 basins of gold of 1,000 drams, two vessels of fine copper, precious as gold. And I said unto them, Ye are holy unto the Lord. The vessels are holy also. They're dedicated to the Lord. And the silver and the gold are a freewill offering unto the Lord God of your fathers. Watch ye and keep them until ye weigh them before the chief of the priests and the Levites and chief of the fathers of Israel at Jerusalem. So before they started their journey, they weighed all this stuff. Why? Because they're entrusting it to faithful men because at the end they're going to have to give an account of the same things. In the chambers of the house of the Lord, verse 30, So took the priests and the Levites the weight of the silver and the gold and the vessels to bring them to Jerusalem unto the house of our God. This reminds me of Luke 16, 10. Jesus said, He that is faithful in that which is least. And if you read Luke 16, 10, what is he talking about? He's talking about money. He says, if you're faithful in that which is least. In other words, if you're faithful in the thing that God says is the least important. Now, our culture has this flipped on its head. Our culture thinks money and possessions are the most important. Jesus said the opposite. If you read Luke 16, 10 in context, what he's saying are material possessions are the least important things. How many of you would agree with that? How many of you would agree that the greatest gifts you got this Christmas weren't necessarily things that came in a box? But maybe it's family or love or peace or joy, contentment, uh, souls, nothing greater. But nonetheless, does, do material possessions matter? They do because what we do with them shows our level of faithfulness. Luke 16.10, he that is faithful in that which is least, money, is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. These men were spiritual leaders. This money was the least important thing, but yet their faithfulness in the least important thing showed their faithfulness in more important things, the most important things. Look at verse 31. Then we departed from the river of Ahava <coughs> on the twelfth day of the first month. They left after seeking God's face to go unto Jerusalem, and the hand of our God was upon us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy. And if such as lay in wait by the way. So notice there were people laying in wait by the way, trying to take what they had, trying to hurt them. You think that just happened by chance? No, they, Ezra gives God the credit, and God deserves the credit. But I also say this, Ezra, before he took the first step of the journey, what did he do? He sought God's face. Lord, we need your plan. Lord, we need your direction. Verse 32, and we came to Jerusalem and abode there three days. Now on the fourth day was the silver and the gold. By the way, that's a quick verse. We read through that, but that took four months. If you read previously, you know, we just read, they came to Jerusalem. It took four months to do that. And we came to Jerusalem and abode there three days. Now on the fourth day was the silver and the gold and the vessels weighed in the house of our God. By the hand of Merimoth, the son of Uriah the priest, and with him was Eleazar the son of Phinehas, and with them was Jezebad, the son of Jeshua, and Noadiah, the son of Benui, Levites, by number and by weight of everyone, and all the weight was written at that time. You know what that proves? It proves, first of all, the protection of God. They made it the entire journey, and nothing was missing. Secondly, that proves the faithfulness of God's servants. They made it the entire journey, and God's servants had taken care of the possessions that were freely and willf willfully given for the work of God. Verse 35, also the children of those that had been carried away, which were come out of the captivity, offered burnt offerings unto the God of Israel, 12 bullocks for all Israel, 96 rams, 77 lambs, 12 egoats for sin offering. All this was a burnt offering unto the Lord, and they delivered the king's commissions unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors on this side of the river, and they furthered the people and the house of God. Do you notice that? They furthered. What they further? Yes, the house of God, the building, but not just the building, the people themselves. Ezra 7.10, why did Ezra come in the first place? He, why did he seek God's face? He sought God's face. So one, he could know the law of God. Two, so he himself would do it. And three, so he could teach others. 
And how did he further the people? By teaching them the words of God. And when they listened and obeyed, that furthered them, that advanced them, it prospered them as they heeded and yielded to the word of God. Let's bow our heads together, please. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, however the Lord's spoken to you tonight, would you just yield to him?